also community engagement. We have many churches uh, running NGOs and even running some organizations that try to help various communities provide interventions for them to deal with their uh, state of poverty. Churches are able to give um, sometimes soft loans, sometimes grant, and sometimes scholarship. This is Out of the Margins podcast. The podcast space, especially in the Christian world, is saturated by Western voices. But if we want a diversity of thought to face the future together, we need to step back and hear voices from out of the margins. Here, we will be offering insights from experiences and perspectives from the majority world. My name is Edgar. And I'm Simon. And on each episode, we will be bringing to you our conversations with pastors, leaders, and scholars from the majority world. This podcast is brought to you by Young Langham Australia. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Out of the Margins podcast. It's wonderful to be with you here again, Edgar. Yes, how exciting. Tell us what we're talking about today. Yes, for sure. Well, in different parts of the world, the gospel takes shape, uh, touching the lives of people, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But not only person, at a personal level, but also at a communal level. And today, that's a, the topic that we are exploring, the topic of social justice, how the gospel shapes society in, in different contexts. Okay, so I want to start by speaking for uh, those of our listeners whose hackles might be up in reaction to the term social justice. Sometimes I think as evangelicals, uh, we recoil at the concept of social justice because that concept can be wrapped up in modern politics and all the baggage that might come with that. But if that's you, I want to encourage you to just keep an open mind and a willing heart as we draw on the wisdom of strong and faithful Christians who come from contexts outside our own. And I think we'll have a lot to learn. Uh, Edgar, who are we speaking to today? Yes, I had a chance to talk to Langham scholar Manuel Ramos from Colombia and Langham author Isaac Bohem from Ghana. So let's just go and listen to the conversation. My name is Manuel Ramos. I am from Colombia in South America. I'm currently a Langham scholar, so that means that I'm I'm doing a PhD in Old Testament at Asbury Theological Seminary. We are we with my wife. I'm well. I'm married <laughs> with Loida. We have two children, and we are missionaries with United World Mission. They have a, like a department called TI Theological Education Initiative. So our purpose is to go back to Latin America to teach in a seminary when I finish my my studies. So currently I am almost halfway of the process and we are here in in Wilmore, Kentucky in the USA. I have some sad news for the tea drinkers out there. Manuel doesn't drink tea. So I will spare you from the comments that he makes on tea. I, I just... Don't like it. I know. I'll give you a moment. Okay. Now let's move on to the topic at hand. We are talking about social justice. So first, Manuel offers a definition of social justice so that we know what we are talking about here. Well, in like in the contemporary sense of of the expression, we refer to social justice to fairness of the fair treatment and equity that like the equitable status of all individuals and every social groups in a society. That will be like the contemporary sense. But from a Christian or biblical perspective, what it's similar to the expression of social justice comes from like two main Hebrew words with our, our mishpat and, and sedeka or, or tzedek, which are usually translated as justice and righteousness. And we, in 
several occasions we find these two expressions together, and they are related to what we understand today as a social justice, but is is broader than that. So, in the Old Testament, this this expression, in the one hand, is referring to the idea that within a community, every member of that community has an obligation to one another. That we ought to be doing the right thing to one another, and we should be faithful, fair, and and generous to one another. So that's what's that's one side of it. And on the other hand, it's viewing people with power as having the responsibility of using that power or that authority to see that the community, that society, it's operating in that kind of way where fairness and equity are, are present. So this this idea of, of righteousness and justice is to influence everything we do in, in society from a, a scriptural basis. And it is based on the character of God, on who he is. And it's not only a theological concept, but it is completely practical. It has to be shown in, in our everyday activities. And the example comes from God. You see, like, for example, in the Exodus, when he is liberating Israel from the oppression of Pharaoh and Egypt, he's not only taking them out of the oppression, he's given them a land. He is bringing wellness and prosperity to them. Uh, so God, with his action, has shown Israel as well. And that's why we find repeatedly, treat well the foreigner because you were foreigners in, in Egypt and you know what it means to be a foreigner. So you have to do the same. This definition that Manuel offers on social justice has a biblical foundation, but it's also a critical reflection of the political, economic, and social realities in Latin America, which is what contextualization of the gospel is about. You can hear more about this topic on episode one, which is about making the gospel relevant and impactful. Point five of the Lausanne Covenant puts it like this. We affirm that God is both the creator and the judge of all men. We therefore should share his concern for justice and reconciliation throughout human society and for the liberation of both men and women from every kind of oppression. And then, here too, we express penitence both for our neglect and for having sometimes regarded evangelism and social concern as mutually exclusive. Although reconciliation with other people is not reconciliation with God, nor is social action evangelism, nor is political liberation salvation. Nevertheless, We affirm that evangelism and social political involvement are both part of our Christian duty. The salvation we claim should be transforming us in the totality of our personal and social responsibilities. Faith without work is dead. One of the the, the biggest issues we have is, is regarding the armed conflict that it's been ongoing for decades. You know, despite The, the peace agreement in 2016 with the FARC, with the guerrillas, violence and, and abuse continue from other armed groups. There are the dissidents of that group that did, did not agree with the process. And there are other paramilitary groups like the ELN that continue to displace people, to murder people, child recruitment and kidnapping kidnappings increase in, in 2023, according to the reports. Colombia has one of the largest internally displaced populations in the world. And by the end of 2023, we had 6.8 million of people displaced, mainly because of violence. So the people who have been displaced from their, the lands or the countryside or the places where they live, they had to move to other places because they were threatened because of these armed and criminal groups. Many of them had to flee from the countryside 
and go into the cities without knowing anybody, without having families, and then having to live in under the line of poverty. And this situation, it's mainly caused by these armed groups. And of course, with that is the increase of poverty, people being even more vulnerable with no access to safety, to health, to education. And along with all this armed conflict, also by the end of 2023, Colombia hosted more than 2.8 million Venezuelans who were fleeing from their country. Same situation, fleeing from, from violence and extreme poverty. They came into a country full of complexities and, and social needs. And well, of course, that increased the rates of poverty, even criminality and abuse of human rights. Manuel also explains that corruption is at the heart of these injustices. It's the main issue that is causing all the issues that I have mentioned. It's the main cause of injustice in our country. In Colombia, corruption is a systemic evil. What I mean with systemic is that it, it is in every area of society. It is not only present in those who are administering justice in the country, but it's every area. You, you would say that it's sometimes expected. <laughs> you know, when you're stopped by a policeman and you're driving, in the mindset of the Colombian would be you're committing an infraction, but there will be the possibility of getting out of it by paying a bribe. Or sometimes the officers would ask for a bribe. So it is something that needs a deep, deep transformation of our culture. There's this thought that the person who is corrupt, that hacks the system and gets away with it, it's a smart person. We have this saying in Spanish, el vivo vive del bobo. It's like the smart guy lives from the dumb guy. And it's the idea that a person could be admirable or can be considered smart because he's outsmarting the system. You would hear this in, in the Latin American mindset. I'm not killing anybody. I'm not doing harm to anybody. But when I am participating in that, I am feeding this system to continue. I am contributing to this system of corruption. And what the idea that we find in the Old Testament is that your action affects the whole community. And the community is going to be accountable for, for those actions. Given this context of systemic corruption, we need to ask ourselves, how is the church in Colombia responding to this? There are many, many things that the church is doing in Colombia. But I would say that it is mainly responding to the consequences of injustice and the violation of human rights. So, for example, several organizations that I've worked with be before coming here, one of them was a Prison Fellowship Colombia. They have different programs that are working towards a transformation and benefiting people living in prison reality. So, For five years, I was the sponsorship manager for the Children of Prisoners program that was serving more than a thousand children in the country. So, you know, when one of the parents go to prison, the child is even more vulnerable. So this program would provide assistance in nutrition, education, spiritual formation, and different kinds of activities that would help these children and their families to survive and to have a better living. This organization, Prison Fellowship, would also offer microloans to women who had their husbands in prison. So they would start a micro business from home, like selling food or sewing clothes or things like that, things that they could do from home so they could still take care of the children while producing a little income. 
And another of the programs that I participated in, it was called Restorative Communities. And we would go to the countryside communities that were affected by the armed conflict, and we would do restoration. It was called Restoration Cycles. And it was a series of workshops where we would work with the victims and the offenders, and the process would end up in a reconciliation process and a symbolic restitution of the the harm that was done. In the cases of violence, and especially when family members were killed, there's not much that an offender can do for restitution, I mean. But for the community, it would be a symbolic activity that would include both sides of the conflict, the victim and the offenders. So, for example, there was a town that the final action was to restore a road that was one of the main roads in the town. That it was in very, very bad shape, probably also affected by bombs and the armed conflict. So they would work together victims and offender and all of us who were working in the project and we will build a new road as a symbol for the community that there was a, a restoration process and the reconciliation process it's a beautiful beautiful project that it's, it's ongoing during last summer that i took a, a, a mission group to to medellin in colombia so they could know the context and know some of the ministries that are doing this kind of work. And we visited a church of the Covenant Church denomination. So just to give you a picture, to get there, we had to take a taxi to the metro station, then take the metro or the train. And then in the train station, we would take a cable car that would take us up the mountains, like for half an hour. And then... We had to take a bus for another half an hour. And then we, when we got off the bus, we walked like for another half an hour. That's how far this community was. So we get there, we went there to see what the church is doing. And we were surprised with this amazing church that is engaging actively the community and more than a church in the traditional sense of a, only a worship building. They're more like a community center. It's a place that is open to the community and they are developing programs, not only designed by the church, but also in partnership with the government. So for example, one of the groups, it's called Women of Memory. And this is a project that is supporting women that were displaced by violence. And, and they would help these women through workshops and handcrafts to process what they've been through. So they would produce these beautiful handcrafts and books and pictures and art about the traumatic experience they had, but not also in this psychological and spiritual sense, but they would also had a dining table for grandmothers who were displaced and, and were in charge of young children. So these women would go there and have two or three meals a day because of their vulnerable situation. Another program this church was, is also developing is one thing they observe in the community is the high rates of pregnancy in adolescents. So they developed this program through sports and especially soccer. And they invited different young girls from the community and through sports and doing in a kind of discipleship. And through that program, they have decreased the rates of pregnancy in, in adolescents. So this is an, a beautiful, beautiful example of what the church can do. It is really encouraging to hear so many examples of how the church in Colombia is making an impact in society having all these initiatives and projects to help people. Manuel ends with a vision about how he sees justice in Colombia. What I hope to contribute to is through the theological education that I can inspire pastors and leaders so they can inspire their congregations to live as, as the people of God, you know, 
the it is the the huge contradiction we have in Colombia is that about 86% of the population identifies as Christian and I'm including Catholic and I'm Protestant 86% but yet we have one of the highest index of corruption in the world and that has a correlation with poverty we have a very high index of poverty and injustice so how is that a country with this high number of christians how is that the country is living in, in such situation so my hopes are that we as christian could understand what is our identity as children of god and that in we can live in a proper relationship with god and if we are in a proper relationship with god our life and everything we do would be transformed even though we are colombia in a lay country if our actions if the action of the majority start to change i have no doubt that the country would change i think that we are called to live as the children of god doing justice and righteousness in every area where the lord has put us that means that the business person would pay timely payment to his or or her employees that means that the student would not cheat for his tests or at school that means that the christian lawyer would do things right or the christian judge or the christian policeman would not take bribes you know that we with our actions would show what it means and to be a child of god and and in that way we would we would reflect who god is it is truly encouraging to see so many examples of the church in colombia being the hands of christ in taking practical actions to show god's justice and kingdom on the context of colombia Now we're going to move to Ghana to see how justice is reflected in a Ghanaian perspective. My name is Isaac Boahen. I'm a Ghanaian and I'm an Akan by ethnicity, but a Bolo by tribe. I was born into a Christian family, but I got converted around 2005 after my Tertiary education, I became a teacher, and it was in that context that God called me into the Christian ministry to become a minister. So I went to the seminary in 2013, and in 2016 I completed. Then I did my Master of Theology at the South African Theological Seminary, which I completed in 2019, and later did a PhD at the University of the Free State, South Africa, in 2021. And I had some later training also in Kenya because I'm also a Bible translator. And so I had some training in Kenya. So Kenya, Ghana, and South Africa, these three places, they are the places where I've had my education allowed. To add that, I'm married and I have five kids. Again, I have other sad news. Isaac doesn't drink tea. So we ended up talking about Milo. So let's just move on to the topic at hand. From my Christian perspective, social justice has to do with the biblical mandate to each and every Christian or to each and every person to uphold fairness, equality, and dignity for all individuals, especially the marginalized and um the vulnerable in our societies. It has to do with recognizing and addressing systematic injustice, inequality, oppression that we find in the society that at the end of the day hinder the society from progressing and flourishing. But I would like to add that at the core of social justice is Jesus' point that we need to love and show compassion and solidarity with the poor and the marginalized. So there is the Christian principle 
the golden rule that we should do unto others, what we would have them do unto us. And whatever goes contrary to this becomes a form of social injustice or injustice in general. So that is how I would define it from my Christian perspective. I find it quite interesting that in Isaac's definition of justice, he emphasizes the poor and the oppressed in society. That is, for justice to be evident in a society, it needs to advocate first for the poor and promote human dignity, empowering the marginalized. Isaac also shares about the social injustices in Ghana. The issues in Ghana that borders on uh, social justice. I think I'll mention three or four. The first one has to do with economic inequality. Ghana is divided into 16 administrative regions. And it happens that most of these regions have been marginalized. They have become less endowed. And the sharing of the national cake is not done equally. Even though the government is trying to put measures in place to break the gap, you find out that some of these measures end up widening the gap between the rich and the poor. So economic inequality is the first one that I think needs attention. Then the issue of poverty. We have a lot of people living in abject poverty. They are not able to afford quality food. They are not able to afford Electricity bills, bills, they are not able to assess health care. And the, the, the least thing that happens, they are in trouble because they don't have what it takes to live life that is worthy of uh, a human being. Aside that, there is also discrimination. This is the social dimension. There is discrimination. We have different tribes and some feel that they are in the majority. So they discriminate against those in the minority, marginalize them, stereotype them. And at the end of the day, people find it difficult going to certain places but because the person feels that if they go, they are going to be mocked at, they are going to be marginalized, and the majority is going to, uh, as it were, discriminate against them. Then the issue of gender inequality is also another issue that needs attention in the Ghanaian context. Even though for some time now, different governments have been trying all they can to bridge the gap between males and females, there is still room for improvement because you realize that Ghanaians in the Ghanaian um, environment, even there are some cultural issues that go against um, women and try to push them down when Political structures are trying to raise them up. And later in the conversation, we will come to some of these issues. Finally, I would like to talk about um, the issue of corruption. And this is very serious. Ghana is one of the countries that is experiencing a higher rate of corruption. And there are a lot of issues in the public sphere, among politicians, among private individuals, concerning corruption. At the end of the day, it doesn't help the nation to progress. Rather, it leads to a situation whereby people take, take the state's resources, use it to their advantage, and the state continues to be poorer and poorer. So these are some of the things that we can mention in the Ghanaian context concerning issues about social injustice here. To understand better these issues, we need to explore what is beyond the issues, what is at the root of these problems. When it comes to the issue of corruption, I believe that we have weak state institutions. We have weak state institutions because um, the checks and balances in our state institutions, even if the laws are there, we are not able to implement them much. And politicization of, um, how do you call it, the economy. Ghana is such that um, there are two main ruling parties, the NDC and the MPP. It looks like when one party is in power, they are cautious. They don't want to look into the issues of um, the other party that just left power. Even if they do, sometimes the public feel that they don't do that rigorously. 
So at the end of the day, something that happened and you think uh, somebody was going to be prosecuted and probably jail, the person is just uh, quitted and discharged because of some kind of uh, political dimension that is given to it. But aside that, I also believe that this provision in our the various sectors of the economy or the various sectors in the country, the provision is not that much. There is a saying in Ghana like government work is like an elephant. Anybody can just go and an elephant that is already dead, anybody can go and cut part of the uh, carcass for meat. And so anybody who is working in the government sector has that mentality. And it's as if, if um, a job should collapse, it is the government who loses and not the worker. So with that mentality too, people go into uh, the public sector and do all sorts of things that end up um, making the country poorer. But um, so on corruption, I believe that corruption is also due to the fact that um, the wages, Mm-hmm. what people receive at the end of the month. And sometimes it is not something to write home about. Uh, very small. It seems that um, the national income, the way we distribute it, is such that a lot of workers are not able to match the expectations based on their salaries. However, this is not to justify that uh, it is right to be corrupt if your salary is small, but I'm only mentioning something that I believe um, uh, has to do with some of the causes of corruption. In the case of poverty, I indicated in my book on poverty, some of the issues like agricultural practices. You know, in Ghana here, majority of people um, depend on agricultural activities for a living. And so, unfortunately for us, uh, we, we we have not mechanized our farming system. And so we continue to depend on rains. You are not able to do all year round farming because you continue to depend on the weather, the natural weather to be able to farm. At the end of the day, if the rains fail, then the farmer ends up incurring debt. And the poverty cycle continues in the sense that uh, many people go for loans to be able to undertake their farming activities. But quite apart from that, there are also some cultural underpinnings, such as people giving birth to many people because uh, we are told that um, we need to give birth to many. I mean, traditionally, Ghanaians cherish um, many children. And so we have what we call the 10th born ship. If somebody is able to give birth to uh, 10 people, then the person is warded with a 10th born ship known as um, Badujan. This Badujan thing at the end of the day encourages people to give birth even if they don't have the means to cater for their children. But apart from that too, I must say that there are some people who are also lazy and are not finding something to do. So the factors are many. The factors are many. Now, how is the church in Ghana responding to these issues? I must say that the Christian community in Ghana has done something appreciable concerning the issues of social injustices. And so the church needs to be commended, at least in the following ways in which they have tried to address the issue. First of all, the church has involved herself in advocacy and um, awareness. The Christian community has raised awareness about social justice issues through their preaching, teaching, and public um, education at all levels. So you can see that most of the churches use their pulpits once a while or frequently to talk about some of these issues such as um, poverty, such as corruption, and it is something that continues uh, every week throughout various churches. There is also community engagement. We have many churches uh, running NGOs 
and even running some organizations that try to help various communities provide interventions for them to deal with their uh, state of poverty. Churches are able to give um, sometimes soft loans, sometimes grant, and sometimes scholarship. I remember in one of the churches that I pastored, we paid the school fees, the fees of some of the people who gained admission and could not afford it. I've also pastored a church where we have given some grant to some people to begin their, their own enterprises. Even though the amount we gave was not so much, you realize that within their context, it was enough to start their own businesses. Not all of them succeeded, but others succeeded. And this is not something that is only done at the congregational level. At times, it is also done at the diocesan level. In my church, when you talk about diocese, then it is a bigger community of um, Methodists. Uh, we begin with a congregation which is known as a society. Then societies or con congregations come together to form circuit. And various circuits will come together to form the diocese. In my previous diocese, there were a lot of skill training. People were trained how to raise um, grass cutter, how to go into uh, bread baking, how to harvest honey, or how to even, um, how do you call it, um, go into fish farming. And after that, they were given the startup capital. So this kind of activities have been done over the years to help. And aside that, we can also mention policy advocacy. In Ghana, we have more than 70% of our people who claim to be Christians. And so there are times that you realize that the church is trying to use um, the Christians in political positions to influence policy decisions so that at the end of the day, uh, whatever comes out will be according to Christian principles. The final one that I will talk about has to do with interfaith, interfaith, collaborations, and dialogue. You see, no human society at the moment um, is made up of or has people from only one, only one uh, denomination or only one religion. And so in Ghana, too, the story is more different. We have different religions. And Christianity, being the most popular uh, religion in Ghana, has tried to have interfaith dialogue with other faith um, organizations or institutions to ensure that uh, as we are trying to improve upon our lives, our standard of living, there wouldn't be any chaos or there wouldn't be any conflict between people of different uh, fit, uh, with different fit. So at the end of the day, you realize that the interfaith dialogue is bringing about solidarity and co collective action that transcends religious divide and work toward common goals for peace, justice, and um, human dignity. The issue of witch witchcraft acquisition in Ghana, like most other African countries. There's the belief in the existence of evil powers known as um, witchcraft. Um, and the witchcraft power, it is believed, is something that works to the disadvantage of people against whom they are used. So at the end of the day, if somebody finds that one of the family members is um, a witch or a wizard, there is a big problem. And some go to the extent of even shooting them, killing them with a knife, cutlass, whatever. The church has worked in this area very much. And this thing I'm talking about too, you see, it depends on which region one is talking about. It happens to be more prevalent. The injustices, the uh, discrimination, the abuses of people who are suspected to be witches and wizards, they, 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 that is found more in some regions than the other, especially the northern part of the country and some parts in the eastern side of the country. The church has really been at the forefront of efforts to address witchcraft acquisition. And in my church, for instance, um, I have this bishop 
who has been going to the northern part of the country, he goes there, he cancels those who are accused of being witchcraft, and he goes to places where they don't even have uh, drinking water, they don't have schools. So through his own initiative and through donations by some people, individuals, and some organizations, he's able to get them drinking water, he's able to cancel them and bring them back back to their feet. He's able to um, establish schools there for people to be educated. So you realize that the church is practically doing something in that regard. When it comes to the issue of gender inequality and the issue of um, women who are not empowered in our society, the church and Christian organizations in Ghana have launched programs to promote gender equality and empower women across various spheres of the society. Here we can talk about the women group in the various churches. They meet, they talk about their own issues. The church empowers them to be able to speak their mind. This thing has uh, some cultural underpinning in the sense that in the Ghanaian setting, in most of the Ghanaian uh, communities, if there is uh, decision making in public, women are not allowed to, traditionally, traditionally, women are not allowed to share their views. Then even in the house, uh, the man is the head and the woman is like a subsidiary uh, to the man. At the end of the day, the church is trying to use the idea of um, imagodi and the fact that each person, whether male or female, has the, the image of God and for that matter is equal before God. The church is trying to use that as a means of educating people to give women freedom. And the church has gone to a very large extent of even sometimes meeting people's husbands, speaking to uh, traditional leaders so that they also add their voice to. And the church has done well in that regard. When it comes to health and social services, the church has also done well because in Ghana here, when it comes to schools and hospitals, if you take away or if you take out the schools and hospitals belonging to various Christian churches, the government will be left with just a very small, small percentage. So schools clinics, often these community outreach, outreach centers, medical centers, education institutions, the church is going into all these things in order to help improve people's lives so that they can be empowered and even stand against others when they are treating them unjustly. Also, another way in which the church in Ghana tries to address the problem of poverty and economic inequality is through the prosperity gospel. Isaac shares both the positive and the negative impact of this theology. I must say that prosperity theology is a very influential theology when it comes to African Christianity. One of the reasons is that this kind of uh, theology promises material prosperity to adherents. And Africa being one of the continents that is less endowed with people living in abject poverty, it seems this kind of theology resonates or addresses the challenges that people are passing through. And so it is not surprising that um, it happens to be the most influential and the most popular kind of theology. But as you rightly noted, this kind of theology has both positive and negative um, influences. In my book, Poverty, the Bible in Africa, I stated that when I put both the negative and the positive together, overall, the overall impact is negative. That notwithstanding, there are some positive sides that we can talk about so that um, people listening to us may also be informed and together we come out with a holistic way of looking at it and discipleship in general. First of all, it brings hope and empowerment. People are living in poverty. They are hopeless. They don't know what will happen to them tomorrow. They don't know what they will do in life. And that sort of thing, they are not empowered in the sense that 
uh, cultural issues, social issues, they have been marginalized. Then prosperity preachers will come in and say that God is going to make you rich if you do A, B, and C, and if you have faith. So it brings hope. It brings joy. And so people listening to such messages sometimes will shout, I receive. And you see that the service is enjoyable to them. They go back with um, some kind of a mentality that they have conquered and they have been empowered. And it helps in that direction. Then people also give. People are encouraged to give. But the point is that uh, most of the giving is directed towards the religious leader. But that notwithstanding, they are still encouraged to give. And so some give to the community, give to individuals in order to help them also to improve their life. So through prosperity theology, people have become philanthropists and social initiatives. A lot of them have also been uh, done in Ghana. But um, at the end of the day, that is not the end of the story. It breeds materialism and greed in the sense that the, the, the preaching, the theology of prosperity is saying that uh, somebody's faith or somebody's worth, how much somebody is worth before God depends on the person's faith, that must translate into material wealth. So the more material wealth you have accumulated, um, the better in the sense that the more worthy you are and the more uh, pleased God is with you. And so it brings about materialism. People are accumulating. Uh, people are greedy. They don't want to even give if they are not going to uh, receive in return. And so people, people's giving become like business transaction. I'm giving. And if I'm giving, then I have to receive. If I won't receive, then I won't give. That leads also to exploitation and injustices that we're talking about. Apart from that, it also brings about stigmatization. Uh, you see, the, the, the preacher is saying that if you have faith and um, if you have given to God and if you have faith in God, you receive. But not all people who give to God and have faith are able to receive because it is not everybody who automatically become um, rich. That is not the true gospel. Uh, somebody can become rich, but it, it is not true that every individual believer should or will become rich. And if the person is not rich, then the person doesn't have much faith. So if somebody gives and the person expresses faith in God and doesn't get uh, the kind of uh, wealth that has been promised, then it looks like the person's faith is not that much. person's faith is not that much. So uh, those who are living in poverty now see themselves as people whose uh, plight um, depends on them or are caused by their own um, faithlessness or their own uh, inability to express faith in God. So you see two kinds of people in the church. One kind of people, they are the group that are wealthy. They are wealthy and they have accumulated so much money and they are saying that they are before God as people who please him. Then the other side, they are the poor people who are then saying to themselves, it is our own doing. We have not expressed much faith. We have not donated much. And that is why we are not getting uh, money. It leads to exploitation and commercialization, manipulation, and so on and so forth. In Ghana, currently, we have a lot of churches um, African independent churches that have sprung up. Uh, you see a lot of exploitation before you can even see the man of God for counseling. Uh, you are charged some huge amount that you might not get. So you are charged some huge amount and if you don't have, then you are not seeing the man of God. You see the man of God and as a result of commercialization of the gospel, you have to buy a whole lot of, lot of things. You have to buy so many liquids, um, bangles, you have to buy handkerchiefs, you have to buy calendars, and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, if you really want to quite blessings from God, then you have to pay uh, so much. And that is one of the results of a uh, prosperity gospel. So that is another one that I can mention. So 
in effect, when you put the pros and cons together, I would say that um, the prosperity gospel is not doing uh, us any good. We need to revisit it. And if we don't take care, African Christianity cannot grow qualitatively with this sort of theology. Prosperity gospel is without a doubt a complex topic. So just a heads up, we will explore more in depth about this topic on episode 8, where we will explore prosperity gospel from a Tanzanian perspective. So hold tight for that one. Now coming back to this episode, to finish, Isaac shares about his vision of what justice will look like in Ghana. In the future, I hope to see an empowered community or empowered communities in Ghana. I am visiting communities in Ghana and other majority world empowered to advocate for their right. Um, some people are living, they don't even know their right. And so injustices against them, they are not able to even uh, challenge them. So I believe that um, it, going forward, there should be that kind of education. People should know their right and they should stand against people who uh, abuse them. Aside that, I'm looking for social cohesion and unity. As I mentioned, there is margin marginalization. There are so many divisions in the country. And so I hope for a future where diversity is celebrated and respected. So we cannot do anything about our diversity and say that um, we have to be uniform. There will be diversity, but there should be this kind of unity in diversity. So I expect or I foresee a future where social cohesion and unity prevail over division and conflict. This vision entails promoting dialogue, understanding and reconciling uh, divided parties or estranged parties, whether they are coming from ethnic uh, division, religious division or cultural division. We need to do that. Then again, going forward, I want to see a future where there is equitable access to resources. The national cake must be divided equally and people from all uh, backgrounds must be given equal access to it. Again, justice and accountability. In the future, I hope to see strengthened institutions and systems of justice that uphold the rule of law, protect human rights, and hold perpetrators of injustice accountable. This includes combat corruption, promoting transparency and ensure equal access to legal systems so that people who need to go to the law court will be able to assess it. Finally, I'm envisioning a Ghana with sustainable development and environmental stewardship. Uh, I believe that um, Apart from the things that we mentioned, the environment is also another area. And there is a need for sustainable development so that the country can manage um, the resources well, uh, whether natural or human resources, we can manage the resources well. Then we have sustainable development and the environment will also be catered for. I think that the conversation I think that the conversation about social justice can sometimes turn to be... All right, well, I hope that uh, for those of you listening that this episode has been helpful and, and challenging. Yeah. And Simon, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you. What are your thoughts after hearing from our guests? Well, I, I've been really challenged because I think as Western Christians, if we completely dismiss any concept of social justice for the sake of clinging to this perception that we need to hold a certain political ideology, we're making a massive mistake. I think <clears throat> what we've heard here today from Manuel and Isaac is, is a way older concept than any kind of mod modern ideological system. Uh, really... What we're talking about here is just grace. It's about being salt and light in our communities and extending a hand of love regardless of whether or not people are deserving because we've been loved and accepted by Christ as undeserving recipients as well. 
And I think that there's a mistake that we make on both sides of the aisle. We want to stringently categorize who deserves help and justice and equality. From a more conservative perspective, sometimes we want people to be model citizens. We we want them to be grateful and polite and penitent and working towards something better. Um, and, and from a more progressive perspective, we want people who fall under the category of oppression. Uh, we want to recognize groups who deserve help because they are the victims of systematic injustice. But conversely, we want to villainize groups we consider the oppressor. And really, in the end, I, I think these are just two different flavors of the story in the gospel where the legal expert asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? We want to categorize away people that we don't want to help. And and the major difference I see here in your conversations with Manuel and Isaac is that the only category that qualifies people to receive our support as Christians is that they need it. Mm. And I think that's what we need to keep in mind as we keep mulling over these kinds of projects in the future. I think that the conversation about social justice can sometimes turn to be an abstract one here in the West, since the expectation is put on the government to address these social issues. Uh, But in contexts like Colombia and Ghana, it seems like the church deliberating on these issues is not a privilege that they have. It is a reality that the church needs to step up and be light and salt in society. Uh, Because the gospel is indeed more than a personal faith, if Jesus Christ is Lord and King, then the the kingdom has power to change societies. And I'm just excited and happy to hear from from scholars and and strong Christians how they are striving to make that change in their societies. I think that that, uh, that's amazing. Yep. Excellent. Now, to finish, it's just a reality that Manuel and Isaac could not have made the impact that they had without the generous support of donors to the Langham Scholars and Langham Literature Programs. We want to keep seeing people in the majority world grow as carriers of wisdom, as change makers in their community, and as faithful, inspiring ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven the world over. If you want to see this kind of work continue, please consider making a donation of any amount at au.langham.org slash donate. Awesome. For next episode, we are talking about wisdom. What does it look like to live well in countries like Malaysia and Mexico? Our guests and Simon and I will be exploring this topic, which will feature very insightful sayings similar to Proverbs. So please make sure that you tune in for that one as well. And make sure that you follow our podcast and leave us a review. It will really help us to get the word out. Thank you, Simon. It's been such a wonderful experience. Thanks, Edgar. I'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs>